Special thanks for this week's episode goes out to Cord Limited, those design guys at CMB Creatives, producers of Draconian Switch Webzine, and Erotic Art Week TNT. In July, it'll be a year since you've been back from Miss Universe. Tell us how you've, how you've been adjusting the ups and downs and the goods and bads. Well, um, it's definitely fluctuated a lot. It's been, um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's been very all over the place. And I, I mean, when I, when I first, when I finished, I traveled a lot. I went to Vietnam, I went all the way through Vietnam. I went to Cambodia. I went, went back to the States for a while. I just kind of anticipated that coming home would mean like a re-entering the role. And I needed to be myself a little bit more. And, you know, that definitely raises the issue of like, why am I not myself when I'm Mr. Ram Tobago? But there is some sort of, I feel a lot of expectation in the role. So the year has been challenging because of that. But at the same time, you know, it's brought me a whole world of opportunity that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So. Tell me about your, your emotional journey from leaving Trinidad, going to Miss Universe, you know, you've had expectations, we have expectations. Um, Trinidad has had a cost, uh, history of doing very well um, you, that you didn't place. How has that been emotionally for you? You know, it's funny you ask me that because it's probably the most poignant thing that happened in the last year for me personally. And um, no one's ever asked me that in any interview ever. I guess because no one wants to bring it up or it's just one of those things you just gloss over but I mean it was absolutely the most devastating moment. I, I on stage when they call those names and mine wasn't there it was it was shocking more than anything else and I, I'd say that warily because obviously it sounds like I had an expectation to be placed and I, I really did. You know the way the system works is that you go of all the girls who go, there's, you know, there are 80 in total, about half really want to, to win. And the rest of them are happy to be there, you know. And then three weeks later, a month later, I mean, it's really kind of filters you out because you're very tired. It's a very challenging process. And by the end, it's kind of clear who's still competing, you know. And I was definitely one of the people still in the game, still working toward it. And Down to the top, top 20. Yeah, I mean, they choose 15 from the semifinals. This isn't to say that I was so amazing. I'm just saying that there were only about 25 girls really still working toward it, you know? And I, I tried extremely hard. But, I mean, it has definitely been a lesson. I mean, it's one of those things that you just, you have to take the good from it. And uh, the good from it for me is that I generally tend to shy away from things when I don't think I'm going to succeed. And so it was one, it definitely kind of brought to light that it's not about the prize, it's not about the winning and the cliche, it's cliche, but it's true, you know, I really gained a lot anyway. So. I'm surprised that you've said nobody has asked you that question, um, colleagues, friends, you know, if no one has asked you that question, how, how do you get the chance to deal with that, to, to complete the experience, you know, if no one is asking about all aspects of it. It's so funny, I mean, I just don't know, even friends never asked what did it feel like, like, honestly, one of the only people who's ever asked me that, and um, interview or no interview, you know, I, I don't know how you deal with it, I've tried to resolve it to myself, you know, I've had, there's no comparison to other experiences in my life, you know, two years ago my brother died, so it's been tumultuous two years, you know, and but th that moment was still, per for me personally, in my life, it was very hard. And I do find it strange that no one's ever asked. I don't know, I don't know why. And I don't know how you deal with it. I don't know either. <laughs> you know? I wonder if that's why, that's part of some old colonial vestige of, you know, just not speaking about issues. The, 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 I'm really surprised, you know, that you've been going along almost a year and no one has said, you know, tell us about how that experience is. And you know, as you said, I mean, Mr. Ran Tobago has always been successful, you know. And um, so it is definitely something to work through and figure out and try to understand. You spoke about the, the death of your brother 
and it's another um, devastating thing and we're sorry to hear. Uh, tell us about, I was reading somewhere that you were using that as, as inspiration for your fashion, um, your fashion line. Tell us about the fashion line and tell us about the okay. influence of the um, two. Well, Pilar who was 18 when he died in a car accident along with um, three of his friends and someone else and it was a terrible accident. And um, I mean, I was away. I didn't even find out about it till the day after because no one could reach me. I was in Vermont in, in the bush and no one could reach me and oh my God, I can't describe that moment, you know, I can't even begin to think about it. But his death, I think, after a few months, really made me feel like, you know, he was 18. He had barely lived. You know, I don't even know if he ever really had a girlfriend or, you know, I don't know. And I really felt that it was kind of up to me to take that and continue his life. For me, if I continue my life, living it to the fullest as, you know, and, and fulfilling dreams and realizing real aspirations that I'm also, I'm carrying him. He doesn't remain 18, you know, he becomes 19, he becomes 20, you know, he, he grows with me. And, um, and I've always wanted to have a fashion line. I went to design school in New York with the intention of studying fashion. I kind of shimmied around and ended up doing graphic design instead because I thought it was a more practical skill to have and I wanted to move back to Trinidad and blah, 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 whatever reasons I told myself. I think I really just kind of shied away in reality. And now I think it was just the one thing that I knew I had to do. I had to fulfill. And, you know, Trinidad and Tobago Fashion Week is coming up in a month, and, oh, two weeks now. And um, it was the ideal forum. It's, it's three or four days shy of his anniversary when I'm showing. And, um, and I had to name it after him, you know. It was only logical. And I'm very excited. So, uh Tell me how your designs relate to that, to his life, his life experience, and your fashion. Well, this particular I main launch, uh, the first first collection, is has come from some some an aesthetic that I've always admired or been fascinated with, and it's the Boba Shanties. I've always liked to see how they dress. I've always, I don't know, it's just it's not so much fascinating as I'm just drawn to it. You know, the very clean lines and how they wrap their heads, the kind of colors they wear. It's a purely aesthetic form of inspiration. I didn't, I didn't delve into it in any sort of um, conceptual way. I don't know. It just, it didn't matter to me as much right now that that, that came directly from him. Um, I mean, reggae and like all this kind of like that. We, my brothers and I have always sort of bonded on that. You know, we all very into it, and you know, they're all DJs, and so there's a sort of natural overlap there. But beyond that, there isn't any. Um, for this particular collection. It's much more inspired by um, the collection. The, the, the line itself is much more inspired by him and his life and my, my desire to continue his life. And that to me is all that matters, you know. Mm -hmm. 